That brings the end to the questions. I will now come to Prime Minister's questions. I will first call the Prime Minister to answer the engagement question. I will then call Derek Twig to ask his supplementary. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Let's head to the North West with Derek Twig. Derek. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Halton Council ran out of funding for discretionary COVID isolation payments despite a strict criteria for eligibility. Just 171 constituents have been helped. The Council have applied for further funding, but what the Government have offered will not be enough. Other constituents fail to qualify for help due to the criteria set by his Government. Will the Prime Minister look again at this and bring forward a properly funded scheme so that no constituent is in a position where they cannot afford to isolate? We need this to happen if we are, if we are to continue to drive down COVID-19 infections. Prime Minister. I thank him and I pay tribute to the work of everybody on Halton Council for everything that they've been doing throughout this uh, pandemic. I know it's been very tough on uh, council officials, indeed on everybody else. So we've, uh, contri we've central government's put in another £4.3 billion uh, pounds to help councils uh, throughout the pandemic. Uh, we will continue uh, to support our local authorities and uh, he'll be hearing more from the Chancellor next week. Let's head across to Duncan Baker. Duncan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. If the UK is to become the Saudi Arabia of wind power, then it is off my coast of North Norfolk that is surely the capital. But the current piecemeal and environmentally damaging connection method to the national grid is holding us back, and this was proven by the Vattenfall Judicial Review just last week. We need legal and regulatory reform now. Prime Minister, could this be a job for the new Task Force for Innovation and Regulatory Reform to help us implement the much needed offshore transmission network and meet our net zero targets. Yes. Prime Minister. Uh, yes, indeed. And I congratulate uh, my honourable friend on his campaign to make his constituency the, the Riyadh or possibly the Jeddah of, uh, of offshore wind. Uh, but I can tell him that we are certainly looking at the issue of uh, the transmission network review and we are in the process of, de of developing the necessary regulatory changes. We now come to the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The principles behind the Prime Minister's recovery plan of caution, and it must be irreversible, are, are plainly right. But one of the biggest threats to that is misinformation about the risks of the deadly virus. For example, there have been people saying that COVID statistics appear to have been manipulated, that Monday's roadmap is based on dodgy assumptions and false modelling. Does the Prime Minister agree that these kinds of comments are irresponsible and undermine our national recovery? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, the uh, roadmap that we have set out will, I believe, uh, set us on a cautious but uh, irreversible journey to freedom, and I am glad that he supports the four steps uh, of uh, March the 8th for schools, April 12th for shops, May the 17th for hospitality, uh, June the 21st for everything, and the data supporting all of that, uh, Mr Speaker, has been available uh, to the House uh, since I announced it on Monday. Uh, I think the Prime Minister dodged that question, uh, no doubt because all those comments came from his own MPs some of the 60 or so members of the COVID recovery group. Perhaps the Prime Minister should have a word with them. Yeah. Another big threat, another th big threat to the recovery plan is that around three in 10 people who should be self-isolating aren't doing so. That's a huge gap in our defences and the small changes on Monday won't fix it. That's why Labour has called for the £500 self-isolation payment to be made available to everybody who needs it. Will the Prime Minister just fix this? Yeah. Mr. Uh, Mr Speaker, he knows uh, very well that uh, the, uh, those who are asked to self-isolate already have the £500 uh, uh, test and trace support payment. And I think he also knows, because he, he supported the, uh, the roadmap on, uh, on Monday, that the, uh, eligi he supports the fact that the eligibility criteria are being extended to allow uh, parents and guardians to, uh, who are staying off work uh, also uh, to receive a payment, provided they meet the criteria. I think he's aware of that. Yes, sir. Mr Speaker, three out of ten people who should be self-isolating aren't doing so. That matters to millions of people. 
when it matters if we're going to get the virus under control. The chair of Test and Trace said that people are scared to come forward for a COVID test because they can't afford to isolate. That's the chair of Test and Trace, can't afford it. The government's biosecurity centre concluded that unmet financial need was why some lower income areas are seeing stubbornly high infection rates. So why, after all the billions the government has thrown around, is it still people in low paid jobs who are at the bottom of this government's priorities? Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, actually, Mr Speaker, I think most people uh, looking at uh, what we've done throughout this pandemic, looking at the uh, support, the £280 billion package of support, uh, can see that it is uh, the poorest and the neediest in society, those on the lowest income, who have been the top of the government's priorities. And that is quite right. And, that's, uh, and we will continue uh, to act in that way, Mr Speaker, and uh, he will be hearing more about that next week from the Chancellor, in addition uh, to the discretionary funding we've given councils uh, to support those who need it most, including those, Mr Speaker, who who have to self-isolate. Here's stop. Mr Speaker, here's the difference. If you need £500 to isolate, you're out of luck. If you've got the Health Secretary's WhatsApp, you get a million pound contract. Yeah. Yeah. Turning to next week's budget. Now, I don't expect the Prime Minister to preempt what's in the budget. If I want that, I can read it on the front page of the Times. But can the Prime Minister at least agree with me today? that now is not the time for tax rises for families and for businesses. Prime Minister. Uh, uh, Mr Speaker, I don't know about, uh, about you, uh, but the, the budget is happening uh, next week. It's uh, not a date that is concealed from the uh, right honourable gentleman. Obviously, he knows when it's he knows when it's happening. He knows what it, what to expect. But it's preposterous for him, uh, Mr. Speaker, to talk about tax rises. When I mean, he saw on a manifesto uh, only a, a year ago, Mr. Speaker, or a little over a year ago, to put up taxes by the biggest amount in the history of this country. It is the Labour Party, Mr. Speaker, uh, his Labour Council in Camden, uh, that puts up taxes across the country. That is the way Labour behave, and it's thanks to prudent fiscal management by this government that we've been able to fight this pandemic in the way that we have. Yeah. Yeah. He wants to talk about tax rises, and he should, because this matters. Councils up and down the country are being forced to decide now whether to put council tax up. That's a £2 billion rise on families. I'm not blaming councils. They've been starved of funding for a decade, and Labour and Conservative councils are in the same position. For example, the Prime Minister might want to concentrate on his own constituency, his own council. Hillingdon, Conservative run Hillingdon, is voting to increase tax, council tax by 4.8 per cent. Does the Prime Minister think that they're right to do that? Prime Mr. Speaker, Hillingdon Council, in common with uh, most Conservative councils, has been running lower taxes, uh, lower council taxes than Labour, up and down, up and down the country. He's completely wrong, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to correct him. Uh, he, the top ten highest council taxing councils in this country are run by the Labour Party, Mr. Speaker, and they are, they, they are all going to they are all going to put them, their taxes up. Mr. Speaker, except for one in those top ten, which is Burnley, which is currently in no, no overall control, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, he talks about uh, uh, he talks about London and uh, my own record on on taxes. He should talk to uh, the Labour current Labour Mayor of London, who is putting up his council tax by 10 per cent, because I can tell him that the previous the previous Conservative Mayor of London, Mr Speaker, cut council tax by 20 per cent. That's what Conservative councils do. Uh, the fact is, Mr Speaker, that £15 billion has been taken out of council budgets over the last 10 years. The Prime Minister stopped blaming others for the damage he's done, and he quotes the mayor. He quotes the mayor. This was the former mayor who bought water can that can be used, spent millions on a garden bridge that never got built, and then more recently going to pay rose to Dominic Cummings. Mr. Speaker, this is another PMQs with yet again no answers. And the truth is this: the government spent a decade weakening the foundations of our economy and our country. As a result. We have the highest death toll in Europe. We have the worst recession of any major economy. Families are facing council tax rises, and millions can't afford to self-isolate. And all the Prime Minister offices are returned to business as usual. 
Next week's budget is a chance to choose a different path, to build a stronger future, to protect families, to give our key workers the pay rise they deserve, and to back British businesses by supporting 100,000 new start-ups. Will the Prime Minister do so? Prime Minister. Oh, Mr Speaker, if you'll only wait till next week, I think you'll find that we'll do far more uh, than that paltry, uh, that paltry uh, agenda that he set out. Uh, far more than that. And I must say, Mr Speaker, it is quite mystifying to see the way the right honourable gentleman uh, weaves hither and yon uh, like some sort of druidical rocking stone, uh, Mr Speaker. One week, he, uh, one week he claims that he supports the vaccination uh, rollout. Uh, the, the next week he actually attacks the vaccine task force when they're spending money to try to reach hard-to-reach vaccine-resistant groups and says that kind of spending uh, can't be justified. Uh, one, one week he calls for us to go, go faster. Uh, with rolling out vaccines, when he would have stayed in the European Medicines Agency, which would have made that rollout impossible, uh, Mr Speaker. He vacillates, Mr Speaker. We vaccinate. And we're going to get on, and we're going to get on with our agenda, cautious but irreversibly taking this country forward on a one-way road to freedom. And I very much hope that his support, which has been so evanescent in the past, will genuinely prove irreversible this time, Mr Speaker. Let's head to Yorkshire with Andrea Jenkins. Andrea. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister's roadmap will provide many of my constituents in Molly and Outwood with a vision of hope for the future that life will be set to return to a new normal before the end of June and it allow us to celebrate the Great British Summer. Can the Prime Minister inform the House of the preemptive actions that the government is taking to spot, prevent and limit the damage of any future health emergencies so that, lo so that local economies and constituencies like mine have a sense of certainty that this will be their last lockdown? Prime Minister. Yes, she's quite right to raise uh, the issue of, of local outbreaks and how to tackle them. Uh, that's, and, and particularly with the, the threat of new variants, which she rightly uh, raises. And that's why uh, we have a, a, a very tough border regime, but also a program uh, as we go forward for surge testing, door-to-door uh, -door, uh, testing to ensure that when there is a, uh, a local outbreak, we keep it, uh, keep it local and keep it under control, as we're, as we're trying to do at the moment, as she knows, with the South African variant. Let's head to Roscoe and Lockheber with the leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. Ian. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Next week's budget gives the opportunity to tackle the financial costs of this pandemic. The UK has suffered its worst recession in 300 years, we now need a government that understands the scale of this crisis. Yet, at the very moment that the recovery needs maximum investment to recover, the Tories are threatening austerity cuts that will leave lasting scars in all our communities. Families have already seen their incomes slashed under this government, and now the Tories want to impose a public sector pay freeze and cuts to universal credit. So will the Prime Minister rule out a return to Tory austerity cuts and commit to a major fiscal stimulus of at least 5% of GDP, or will he threaten the recovery and leave millions of people worse off? Prime Minister. I'm proud, Mr Speaker, of the massive investments that the UK Treasury has made throughout the whole of the United Kingdom. Uh, £13 billion and more going to Scotland, uh, huge sums going throughout the, the country. And I, I must say, I wish that the Scottish Nationalist Government uh, would, would spend that money better. Uh, because it's very sad to see some of the failures in education policy in, in Scotland, the failures in their uh, criminal justice policy in fighting crime. And I think what the people of, of the whole UK would like to see, and I believe the people of Scotland, is less talk about a referendum, Mr Speaker, which is his agenda, and more talk about the real issues facing our country. Yeah. Well, back to Ian Blackford. Ian Blackford. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister is boasting, but the cold, hard reality is that the United Kingdom has suffered the worst slump of any major economy and 120,000 people have lost their lives. That's under your guidance, Prime Minister. Coronavirus has exposed the deep inequalities under this broken Westminster system. After a decade of Tory cuts, millions of families are in poverty and UK unemployment is soaring. In contrast, in the United States, President Biden understands what is needed he has proposed a $1.9 trillion stimulus package to restart and renew the American economy. Prime Minister, 
will your government follow the example of the US and boost the economy like Biden? Or does the Tory plan to return to type and impose yet another decade of Tory austerity? Prime Minister. Um, Mr Speaker, the, 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 this, this government is investing a £640 billion in infrastructure alone uh, throughout the, the, the UK. Uh, a massive programme to get our country rebuilt and, and restarted again. And I think that is what people uh, would like to focus on, rather than uh, his agenda uh, to talk about, talk about our broken politics, our broken, uh, our broken uh, country. All they want to do is break up Britain with another referendum. Uh, and I think that is the last thing this country needs at the moment. More. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, knows how important that the rail link between Southport and Manchester Piccadilly is for my constituents and those living in the wider Lancashire area. All of the changes put forward by the Manchester Rail Recovery Task Force are unacceptable. They would stop this, this service from happening and uh, take our uh, levelling up agenda off track. Will my right honourable friend meet with me to discuss changes to these proposals so that we can keep this service and keep my constituents uh, with the service that they've come to rely on and is, which is vital for their economy? Prime Minister. I congratulate my honourable friend uh, for uh, his campaign uh, for better local transport, and uh, we are investing massively in, uh, in rail connectivity in, uh, in his area, in, in local bus routes, and the particular line that he advocates, I know, is one of great interest to uh, my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Transport, and uh, I will make sure that uh, he has a chance to discuss it personally with him. Let's go across to Ed Davey. Ed Davey. Can I start by thanking the government for their change of policy announced today on the vaccination priority for people with learning disabilities, despite the Prime Minister's rather more equivocal answer to me on this last Monday? Mr Speaker, today millions of Uyghur people in China live in fear under a cruel regime. The BBC, international media and human rights NGOs are all reporting on forced labour camps, women being raped and sterilised, and families being separated. This is a genocide happening in front of our eyes. So does the Prime Minister agree with me that unless China ends this genocide, Britain and Team GB should boycott the Winter Olympics in Beijing next year? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, the... Uh... Right Honourable Gentleman is absolutely right to highlight the uh, appalling campaign against the uh, Uyghurs in, uh, in Xinjiang and that's why uh, the Foreign Secretary, my Honourable Foreign Secretary, has uh, set out the policies that he has, the package of measures to uh, ensure that uh, no British companies are complicit in uh, or profiting from uh, violations. Uh, we're leading international action uh, in the UN to hold China uh, to account and will continue to work with uh, the US friends and partners around the world uh, to do just that. He raises a point about a sporting uh, boycott. We're not normally in favour uh, of sporting boycotts uh, in this country, Mr Speaker, and uh, that's been the long-standing position of this government. Let's head to North Cumbria with Dr Neil Hudson. Dr Hudson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Penrith and the border struggles with poor broadband and phone signal connectivity, with download speeds around 56% of the UK average. Many of my constituents have been quoted large and unfeasible sums for new cables to be installed, which is often their only option to improve coverage. I welcome the potential of the shared rural network, the gigabit voucher scheme and the universal service obligation to help. But what reassurance can my right honourable friend give my constituents that government is striving to address these broadband and phone signal not spots in rural Cumbria? Prime Minister. I thank my honourable friend and, uh, and all for all he does to campaign for the, the hardest to reach areas in, in rural Cumbria. And I, I know that we're doing all we can because I raise it virtually every day. Uh, and we are rolling it out as, as, as fast as we can. We've committed uh, about £5 billion to uh, connect those areas, a uh, £1 billion uh, for the shared uh, rural network agreement and a voucher scheme to target predominantly uh, rural areas. But we are intending to get everything we can possibly done uh, by uh, in the next five years. Let's head north to Dame Diana Johnson. Dame Diana. Thank you, Mr Speaker.
Is the 40% cut to transport for the North's budget part of the Prime Minister's plans for levelling up the North? Prime Minister. Uh, there's been no such cut, Mr Speaker, and we intend to invest massively in, um, in uh, Northern Powerhouse Rail, in railways in the North, and uh, across the entire country. Let's head to Susanna Webb. Susanna. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Whilst hospitality has had to close their doors, in true black country spirit, many of my venues have been truly entrepreneurial and now offer a great takeaway service. To celebrate this entrepreneurial spirit, I am launching a favourite takeaway competition in my constituency today. Will the Prime Minister join me in launching this competition and also in a takeaway from the winning entry when he's next in wonderful Stourbridge? He'll receive a very warm welcome and I'm happy to throw in a trip on the country's finest shuttle, which I hope soon to see, called the Stourbridge Dasher. Prime Minister. Yes, uh, I, I congratulate my uh, honourable friend. What she's doing to champion takeaways in Starbridge, I'm not sure it'd be environmentally friendly for me to order a takeaway from Starbridge uh, in, in Westminster, but uh, we will, we will, I, I thank her very much for her initiative and I uh, look forward to uh, visiting uh, the, 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 the hospitality sector in her constituency as soon as possible. West Street. Yeah. Yeah. On, Thank you, Mr Speaker. The education and well-being recovery of children from the pandemic is one of the biggest challenges facing our country. But we went into this pandemic with rising child poverty, a widening attainment gap and school funding falling in real terms. So given that, does the Prime Minister really believe that the 43 pence per pupil per day announced today really cuts it? And if he does, would he really be happy to see that amount spent on his own children? Yeah. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I, I passionately disagree with what he's just said about uh, the spending that was going on. The, the, even before the pandemic, uh, we'd incre we were increasing funding for primary schools uh, for £4,000 per pupil, uh, £5,000 uh, for secondary school pupils, putting up uh, starting salaries for teachers uh, across the board uh, to 30000 a massive investment in education across the board, and in further education as well. And the catch-up funds now amount to £2 billion. Pounds. No, he's wrong. They amount to £2 billion, pounds, Mr Speaker. And yes, we will have to do more, because this is the biggest challenge our country faces. And we will get it done. We're able to do it because we've been running a strong economy and we had the resources to do it because we hadn't followed the bankrupt policies of himself and the party opposite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rob Roberts. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Janine Maguire, in my constituency, who is a mother of three, suffered a very unusual and unexpected and immediate cardiac arrest, which saw her sadly pass away in February 2000. Twenty years later, in August of last year, one of her daughters, Cara, suffered, uh, strangely, the same fate with an unexpected cardiac arrest. Fortunately, uh, her friend Michael was with her, who was a former soldier and thus trained in uh, first aid and life-saving, despite her heart stopping for 20 minutes, he managed to save her life. In September of last year, the UK government made it mandatory for CPR uh, skills to be taught in secondary schools, but despite a campaign and a letter from all of my Welsh Conservative colleagues, the Education Minister in Wales has declined to do so. Would my right honourable friend throw the weight of his office behind my campaign to have CPR skills taught in Wales so that the Maguire family and those like them no longer have to suffer in such tragic circumstances? <laughs> Well, I think the sympathies of the whole House uh, will be with uh, my honourable friend's uh, constituent uh, uh, family and, and friends. And I agree with him very much about the importance of learning CPR, and that's why we introduced it into the curriculum uh, for all state-funded schools in, uh, in England. Uh, it, it, is, it is, of course, a devolved issue, and I share uh, his, uh, his urgency that it also should be adopted in Wales as well. Let's head to Lancashire with Rosie Cooper. Rosie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, much focus of late has been on children returning safely to school. In my constituency, successive cohorts of pupils have had to wade through overflowing drains to get into school and are routinely evacuated from flooded classrooms. That takes a huge toll on the quality of their learning. Will the Prime Minister work again with Lancashire County Council and the head teacher of Town Green Primary School? to ensure that no child in West Lancashire loses a vital day of education, especially to flooding-related issues. 
Prime Minister. I, I thank her very much, I, uh, and I, I, I sympathise very much with her constituents and uh, uh, the pupils who have to uh, put up with disruption caused by flooding. I, I know that the Environment Agency continues to work very actively uh, with, the county, with the County Council uh, to uh, resolve the issues, and that uh, the DEFRA Minister has, has written to her about uh, what more can be done. Let's head to Giles Watling. Giles. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, now, my right old honourable friend will know that pubs have been closing all over Britain for decades now, tearing the hearts out of communities. Now, this terrible pandemic has made things even worse, but part of the problem is undercutting by cheap supermarket booze. But, but now we're out of the EU. Surely we can do as we please with beer duty. Differentiation in favour of on-sales could deliver great benefits to pubs in communities like Clagton at nil cost to the taxpayer. Will my right honourable friend commit ministers to look at this differentiation proposal? Uh, Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, he makes an extremely good point, which I'm sure will be uh, heard with great interest uh, around the, the country. And uh, uh, there is a, just such a review uh, being carried out after consulting uh, pub owners and uh, brewers and, and others. And I know that the Chancellor is looking very closely at the findings. They said no to Alex Cunningham. Alex. Mr Speaker, I was disappointed that the Prime Minister didn't accept my offer to meet with him when he recently visited my constituency's wonderful Fujifilm vaccine complex in Billingham to celebrate our local success story. I could have taken him to nearby Billingham Food Bank where he would have learned that over a third of the children in my constituency live in poverty and yet two in five of those same children are still not entitled to free school meals because the threshold is so low. Will the Prime Minister urgently address this scandal, take long-term action on universal credit and school meals, and help free our children from poverty? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I, 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 I certainly uh, am proud of what universal credit is. It's odd, odd to be attacked uh, by a Labour member over universal credit when it's the, his party's policy to abolish uh, that, that, that benefit. Uh, but. Uh, the, most, the best thing we can do for uh, families in, 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 in Billingham is ensure that there are very good jobs there. It was wonderful to see what's happening in, uh, in Teesside uh, under the leadership of Mayor uh, Ben Houchen, uh, uh, the investment that is going in by Fujifilm uh, and others, which will create long-term jobs. And it's the belief of this side of the House, Mr yeah. Speaker, that that is the route out of poverty. Uh, it's fantastic education and top-quality jobs. And that's what this government aims to deliver. Said to the South West with Jack LePresti. Jack. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My right honourable friend will recall from his visit in 2019 that the port of Bristol will make an excellent location for a great western freeport. And the West of England Mayor Tim Bowles has submitted a bid which could create 50,000 jobs in the region. Will the Prime Minister back our bid and also agree with me that with house prices in the West of England sitting at nine times average earnings, we need a home building revolution? to provide much more affordable housing for our young people as we build back better. Prime Minister. My honourable friend is absolutely right in what he says about, about home building and about the need for housing across the, the country. Because you sometimes hear that, oh, this is a problem just uh, mainly in London and the South. It's not at all. It's everywhere in the country, as he, as he rightly says. Uh, and I want to thank, every, I wanna thank, by the way, uh, Tim Bowles. Uh, for what he's done, uh, the, the mayor for the West of England, or everything that he has uh, that he has done now, as he stands down, and uh, we intend to uh, help build on his legacy with a massive uh, home building program and home ownership program, home ownership program, Mr. Speaker, across the country. Let's head to Cumbernauld with Stuart C. Macdonald. Stuart C. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Before the budget is finalised, could the Prime Minister ensure that his Chancellor reads the Trussell Trust's new report, Dignity or Destitution, the case for keeping the universal credit lifeline? His government has been incredibly generous to pals with PPE contracts, so surely, instead of cutting employment-related benefits to their lowest real terms level in 30 years, he must now afford some basic dignity to 6 million people on universal credit and make the uplift permanent. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, we will continue to uh, look after people throughout this pandemic uh, and beyond, and the best thing we can do across the whole of the country is to bounce our economy back as fast as we can, get people into high-quality jobs. As I said uh, to the previous member, that is the agenda of this government. Final question, Christian. 
thank, thank you, Mr. Uh, Speaker. Um, I'd like to start by thanking my right honourable friend, the Education Secretary, uh, for his announcement of a new high school for Redcliffe on the back of my campaign. Uh, this new high school will be the kickstart for regeneration that the town is desperately in need of. The towns like Redcliffe and Presswich, which haven't received uh, towns fund or future high street funding, can my right honourable friend advise what assistance this levelling up government can provide to make sure these towns aren't forgotten? Well, first of all, Mr. Speaker, I congratulate uh, my honourable friend for his successful campaign uh, to uh, get a new high school. It's absolutely vital. The best place for uh, for kids is in uh, is in schools. I hope we will hear from the the Labour Party very shortly. Uh, and. Uh, we, are, we are investing in uh, his area, Mr Speaker, uh, to the tune of £660 million and more through the Local Growth Fund, uh, £54 million through, uh, through the, get, the Getting uh, Building Fund, uh, and of course also in the, the transport network. And next week the whole House will be hearing even more about what we propose to do to steer a path uh, cautiously but irreversibly, Mr. Speaker, out of this pandemic and allow this economy to recover and to build back better across the whole of the United Kingdom. I am suspending the House for three minutes to enable the necessary arrangements for the next business to be made. Order.